Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome. Thank you very much uh, for coming to tonight's event, Direct Democracy, Participation Without Populism. Um, if I could all ask you to uh, put your phones on silent, that would be great. Uh, my name is Razia Iqbal. I present uh, news and current affairs programs at the BBC, News Hour on the World Service, and The World Tonight on Radio 4. It's my huge pleasure to introduce tonight's distinguished panel. Uh, in the middle there is Nicholas Bergruen. He's chairman of the Bergruen Institute, which addresses fundamental political and cultural issues in our rapidly changing world. To his right is Nathan Gardels, who is editor-in-chief of The World Post and senior advisor to the Bergruen, Bergruen Institute. Together, they have written Renovating Democracy, Governing in the Age of Globalization and Digital Capitalism. The book will be on sale afterwards, and I think Nathan is staying around to sign, um, sign some of those books. Alongside Nicholas is uh, Chatham House's very own Hans Kunnani, uh, Senior Research Fellow in the Europe Programme and the Project Lead on Democracy and Technology. And tonight's discussion is one of a series which is part of this project. Welcome to you all. Um, each of the speakers is going to address you for about five to seven minutes and then we're going to have a little discussion and then we will open it out to the audience. Um, the event is on the record. It's going to be live streamed. In fact, it must be being live streamed as we speak. And if you'd like to participate on social media, the hashtag is CHEvents. Uh, and I'm assuming you've all turned your phones off. Right. So um, what are we going to be talking about? In recent years, the rise of populism in the West, China's growing influence in global governance and Russia's alleged interference in foreign elections have prompted a deep rethink of how democratic systems work and how they don't work. Increasingly, liberal democracies are accused of failing to address dislocations of globalization and the role of technology in amplifying tribalism, thus polarizing societies and paralyzing governments. So it's against this backdrop that the panelists are going to consider whether and how democratic systems can be rethought and rejuvenated in the 21st century. What new ideas, partnerships and frameworks of governance have the potential to renew existing institutes of democracy, institutions of democracy. Can social networks and digitization be used to deepen political engagement and empower direct participation without fueling populism? And is it possible to reconcile the power of direct participation with the values of deliberation, pluralism, and compromise? Big, urgent issues. Nathan, please, will you set Thank us you. off? Thank you, Razia. Um, let me begin, although we're going to focus on uh, democracy and deliberation and participation without populism, let me just first very briefly lay out the main themes of the book and how they relate to each other. Because what we try to do in the book is address uh, how open societies govern themselves facing the biggest, challenge on the near biggest challenges on the near horizon, which is um, the participatory power of social media, digital capitalism, and the reappearance of China uh, to center stage, uh, to center uh, on the world stage. So the way we, we, we frame the book is that we're seeing the rise of populism in the West and the rise of China in the East and the spread of social media everywhere, uh, as uh, Razia said, is prompting a rethink of how democratic systems work or how they don't work. Globalization and digital capitalism are creating new classes of winners and losers that the old social contract is not configured to deal with. Now, we're not going to focus on China tonight, but China comes into the picture because it challenges the dysfunctional democracies of the West to get beyond polarization and paralysis and reach a governing consensus by other than illiberal means or fall into second class status on the world stage. Uh, I'm not telling you anything new to say that we have uh, a so-called leader of the free world uh, who relishes battling his way through every 24-hour news cycle by hurling barbed tweets at sundry foes. By contrast, China's leader has used his enormous power to lay out a roadmap for the next 30 years. So there's the challenge. Now, uh, uh, in the book, we um, propose several responses to these challenges. Uh, the three P's. We're going to focus on the first one, but let me just go through the, the three P's. Participation without populism, pre-distribution of wealth instead of redistribution only, uh, and positive nationalism. 
participation without populism. And here's the basic principle we're going to get, in, get into the discussion. We can talk about California, where we're from, which is very engaged in direct democracy for, for good and for ill. But basically, the, the, the notion is that since social networks have drawn more players into the political fray than ever before, never has the need been greater for the counterbalance of impartial practices and institutions to sort out the cacophony of voices, the welter of conflicting interests, and the deluge of contested information, to mend the breach of distrust between the institutions of self-government and the public, we call for a new form of citizen engagement uh, participation without populism, which essentially means integrating social networks and more direct democracy into the system through new, medi new mediating institutions that complement representative government. We can talk a lot more about California and our experience in direct democracy, but just to give an example here in, in, in Britain, if such a public forum for deliberation had been in place before the Brexit referendum, and all the consequences we now know had been aired, the outcome would likely have been quite different. Uh, Predistribution, second point. Uh, the innovations of digital capitalism are steadily disruptive and increasingly divorcing employment and income from productivity growth and wealth creation. A social contract that responds to this dynamic should protect workers instead of jobs as they constantly churn through innovation and foster an ownership share by all in the wealth generated by the robots that are displacing gainful employment. The aim is to enhance the uh, skills and assets of the less well-off in the first place, pre-distribution, instead of only distributing wealth of others after the fact. We call this universal basic capital. The idea is not just to break up concentration at the top, but to build wealth from the bottom. The simple message is, uh, uh, if you want to fight inequality in the digital age, the best way to do it is to spread the equity around. Finally, a positive nationalism. To harness globalization, we call for dialing back one-size-fits-all hyper-globalization through allowing industrial policies for nations to build their own economies and embracing the idea of uh, positive nationalism which means an allegiance to the values of inclusive society instead of nationalist incantation, but understanding at the same time that open societies require defined borders. Uh, now, we also have uh, ideas to deal with China, but I'm going to skip those uh, for this session and simply say that um, unless we follow a path along this course, uh, to deal with the internal issues of democracy, as we were discussing earlier, much of the debate these days is, oh, it's democracy versus Russia and China. It's not about what's happening in democracy, how it's working or not working. Unless we follow a course along the path that, that uh, I've outlined here, uh, our fear is that the West will be positioning itself on the wrong side of history. Excellent. So, Thank you yeah. very much indeed. Uh, Nicholas. Well, I'll just say a couple of words on one of these three Ps, pre-distribution. I know we're going to speak mostly about um, democracies and how to recast uh, democracies in a system or in a way that can allow much more participation in a productive way. Uh, but the pre-distribution idea is something that we are really testing. And the reason why I want to expose it is we'd love to get feedback. Um, the idea simply being that in traditional capitalism, labor and capital were really the ones that um, would fight it out and had, let's say, a way, you know, had to divide um, the uh, spoils. And the reality is that more and more of the value is going to the intellectual property, uh, much more than capital <coughs> or uh, labor. If, uh, if you look at the most valuable businesses that have been created and that are actually the most valuable businesses in the world over the last 15 years, they've been created with almost no capital uh, and very little labor. So you can see that the value is accruing more and more towards IP and algorithms are going to become more and more valuable. So the question is how do you share those uh, in a way that's fair? 
And our thinking is, as opposed to having a big fight to take from the ones who own the IP and redistribute to the ones who don't, uh, let's turn things around uh, and have everybody own a piece of the IP, own a piece of the robot from the beginning. And you can do it. Uh, you can do it thanks to technology, and you can also do it conceptually. So if you started a new business, as opposed to, um, let's say, Nathan owning 100% or Hans or Asia owning 100% of the business, you could own 70% of the business. It wouldn't make a difference. If you're successful, you're very successful. You're going to be very rich. Um, but if 70% is owned by the state, meaning, uh, let's say, through, through sovereign wealth fund, owned by all citizens, then everybody is participating in the uh, great company that uh, Razia has created. And everybody, uh, including the state, is on the same side as opposed to you know, the other side. States normally um, are debtors. <coughs> in this case, the state becomes an owner on behalf of citizens. So the idea is to change the, the uh, equation to everybody being a participant, everybody being in the same boat, everybody uh, being an owner uh, of the future. And that's, we think, an interesting concept to, um, to test. So the idea being simply that a lot of these discussions, democracy, capitalism, geopolitics, take concepts that exist that are fairly you know, standard in terms of history, but try to turn them around. Uh, same principles, but change um, the, 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 the game, change the board, so that you bring people in together as opposed to fighting each other, which is where we are in terms of the democratic debates. You have um, people against each other everywhere within nations, within uh, parties, within almost any society, and you have the same thing in capitalism. Capitalism has conquered the world, but how do you make capitalism work for everyone? And that's an idea that we've thrown out. So sorry, this is uh, very specific, but I wanted to uh, expose it. Hans. Meta, thank you. Hans, why don't you um, uh, contest, if you, if you want to, some of the things that you've already heard, and then we'll open it up a bit more. Thanks. Um, so I'm I mean, first of all, I should say I'll focus on the democracy parts rather than the, the, um, the economic part or the geopolitical parts. Um, and I, I agree with much that's in the book, um, but I'll, for the sake of argument, focus a bit on some of the things that I see slightly differently. Um, and in particular, what I'll try and do is, um, as you said, Nathan, um, this is very much you know, based on the American experience, the Californian uh, experience in, in particular. Um, it seems to me that if you approach this from a European um, perspective, um, based on the European experience, some of these questions actually look a little bit, um, a little bit different. So I'll, I'll try and talk a, bit, a little bit about that. Um, let me start with this idea of a crisis of liberal democracy, um, because um, I have to say it's not obvious to me that there is a crisis. Everybody says there's a, there's a crisis. Um, but actually, um, putting your finger on what exactly the crisis is, or whether there even is one, I think is actually quite tricky. Um, David Runciman, the Cambridge professor of politics, um, points out that a democracy functioning badly looks quite a lot like a democracy functioning quite well. It's quite difficult to tell the difference between the two. And I think Britain right now is a good example of this. It's not obvious to me that we're having a crisis of democracy. I think that we are, personally. I agree with you that we are. As I say, I don't think it's obvious. But even if we agree that we are having a crisis, um, um, it, it seems to me there are very different ways of understanding what the crisis is, what's caused it, um, and it, I think this, this matters quite a lot. Um, so, for example, you talk um, in the book about the de decay of democracy in the past several decades, um, and I agree with that, but um, it seems to me, as I say, quite difficult to know how to understand this current populist moment, if that's the right way to describe it, in that context. So, for example, one of the um, indicators that you would have pointed to as a sign of this um, decay of democracy would have been the decline in voter turnout, right? Which you know seems over the last you know few decades to have been going downwards, and it seems to have been a chronic trend. But to some extent, that has been reversed in lots of elections we've seen recently, um, and to some extent, as a result of populism. So in Germany, for example, in the last um, general election there, the AfD, which is a party I don't particularly like. <laughs> Um, brought 1.2 million voters who hadn't voted in the previous election back into the political process. 
Um, so in that sense, it seems to me that, um, you know, in some ways, populism is um, providing a kind of correction rather than being um, part of the, um, the crisis itself. And that brings me to the next point. You talk about polarization quite a lot, um, and you seem to take it as axiomatic that polarization is a bad thing. You describe that as going hand in hand with paralysis um, several times um, in the book. Um, and, and so it's something that needs to be sort of minimized. I'm just not sure if that's true. It seems to me that um, you know, polarization can be a good thing or a bad thing. What matters is how you're polarized and what issues you're polarized on. Um, over the last few decades, it seems to me that part of what's happened is an increased polarization, but at the same time, there's also been this kind of increased consensus around some issues, particularly around economic issues. Um, so um, I would actually argue that um, um, you know, as centre-right and centre-left parties have um, converged around basically neoliberalism, for want of a better term, that's part of what's produced extremism. It's forced um, it's forced political opposition to the extremes. And more specifically, if you have this consensus on economic issues, then to some extent you end up fighting, I think, about cultural questions because there's no debate around economic questions. So in a sense, neoliberalism, it seems to me, produces identity politics. Um, and if we compare, say, Britain, Germany, and the United States, it seems to me this mixture of polarization and consensus works differently in each of the three cases. So in the US case, you know, you clearly do have a very polarized society. But it seems to me that um, you've also had this trend of, as I say, convergence between the Democrats and the Republicans around economic policy, coinciding with that increasing polarization. And the problem, it seems to me, is the kind of issues now that America is polarized on. It's these culture war issues around race and religion and so on. That's extremely toxic to be polarized about that. But if you look at Britain, there's a big debate about this. Some people would say the same thing is happening in Britain as in the US, polarization around basically cultural war issues. Another way of looking at it is that we're basically arguing over economic issues and the degree of you know, basically free trade deals and, and the degree of economic openness and so on. That seems to me a much more productive thing for us to be polarized over. And I would argue we should be polarized over it. This is precisely what's supposed to happen in democratic politics. And then Germany, to take the third example, I mean, I think there you could make the case, I've made this case, there's been too much consensus in German politics in the last you know, decade or two, um, that actually you needed more polarization, um, except, as I say, around the right um, kind of issues. Um, so anyway, where all of this kind of leads me is to say that I think um, what we might be arguing about here is how we should understand democracy and different kinds of um, models of democracy. Um, and so when you come to talk about solutions, um, you, you propose these new nonpartisan mediating bodies, as you said in your, in your remarks, as sort of balance elements of direct democracy. So you introduce more elements of deliberative democracy in order to balance out um, the direct democracy. I wondered when I read that, though, whether actually part of the problem, and certainly Danny Roderick, who you mentioned when you used the term hyperglobalization, I think would, would, would agree with this, that, that part of the reason we have this crisis in the first place is because we've had too many of these independent agencies. Too much power has been taken out of the space of democratic contestation and sort of handed over to these um, non-majoritarian institutions, these kind of depoliticized um, spaces. Um, and I think particularly in Europe, that's a problem because in a way the EU is the ultimate example of this kind of depoliticized, technocratic process of, of, um, of governing. So I suppose I wonder whether the solution might be sort of almost in the opposite direction. You um, talk quite um, positively about um, the, the founding fathers in, in the United States and how actually they were quite hostile to democracy, which I think is, is quite right. Um, but you almost seem to suggest that the solution to the crisis of liberal democracy in the United States is to sort of slightly go back to that model. Um, it seems to me that we can't turn the clock back in that way. I think that a big part of what's happened is that our societies over centuries have become much less deferential. And I think part of the reason we're having this crisis right now is because right now they're becoming even less deferential than they were, you know, 10 years or so or go, uh, 10 years ago or so. Um, and so the idea of, for example, a um, upper house, which you propose, which would be, you know, which would consist, I think you describe it as a sober second chamber. 
um, composed of eminent men and women of experience and expertise. I mean, this sounds quite a lot like the House of Lords in the UK, which you mentioned actually at one point. You know, the, the current House of Lords rather than the sort of reimagined House of Lords. Um, I wonder whether actually we need to go in the other direction to accept that societies have become much less deferential, to think about how you deepen democracy rather than sort of limiting it in the way that it seems to me you do. Um, and as I say, to bring it full circle to where I began in terms of talking about um, polarization, it seems to me there are these two models. One is to say, um, you know, the aim here is to sort of create harmony, um, to sort of somehow move beyond the sort of clash of interests that exists in democratic politics. Um, and so you're quite positive about, you know, um, Macron, who you see as non-partisan and non-ideological. That's one model, and I can see the argument for that. I wonder, though, whether actually, um, I mean, certainly the way I think about democracy is that the sort of clash of interests is not something that you can kind of take out of democratic politics. That's the essence of democratic politics. And so, um, you know, actually, um, we need, I think, to go back to... Um, uh, what we used to have, which is where you had a centre-right party and a centre-left party um, representing different interests in society rather than trying to represent the interests of everybody and fighting that out um, and um, going back again to a situation where you had real alternatives in the centre ground of politics, two real alternatives, um, rather than thinking you can somehow transcend that um, with a kind of there is no alternative kind of centrist politics. And thank you. Let, let's let's start then by by drilling down a little bit um, with with you, Nathan, and 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 if you can explain a little bit more in response to to, to the contesting that Hans has just presented, the, the these mediating institutions that you speak of, how how would they actually work? Because you said something quite controversial, that if they had existed and had been in place before the, the Brexit referendum, that perhaps the outcome would have been different. Let's put that to one side, but just explain how those mediating institutions might function. Uh, OK, and then I, I need to respond to some yeah, yeah, uh, I'm sure wrong points and some mischaracterizations <laughs> and, uh, and other I'm stuff. Sure and will. other stuff. Uh, I was trying to, I didn't have a pen. I was trying to remember all of those. but. Um, uh, let me start by, by saying that um, I think the, the, not the assumption of a book, the reading of, of the situation across the Western democracies, whether it's Brazil or whether it's Europe or whether it's the United States, is a rupture between the institutions of public interest or the institution of self-government and the public. Uh, that is a crisis of democracy. Uh, voting, how can I put this? Voting is not what matters most. The, more, the fact that more people are voting is not the issue. The issue is that the, 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 as important as elections are to democracy, what's outside the ballot, ballot box is equally, if not more important, which is impartial institutions that allow you in diverse societies to sort out differences, to make fair trade-offs, and to come to a consensus. That's what's broken. That's what's broken in Britain. That's what's broken in the US. That's what's broken in Brazil. That's what's broken in Italy. That's what's broken in Germany. That's what's broken in France. In France, uh, Macron won his 33 uh, percent. In Germany, in, in the same election or the same election period, M Merkel won her 33 percent. <laughs> you know, but uh, back in I mean, uh, Macron maybe won. I forget what he won exactly, but Le Pen won 33 percent, the same as as Merkel in Germany. So the electorate is divided. There's no consensus. I'll come. Uh, I will address the economic issues, I'm not sure what, what your point there. I don't think there's a consensus of, of, uh, on economics. Um, so the point is, what, if, if what's broken is, the, is, is what's outside the ballot box, the impartial institutions and practices that mediate all these interests in society, uh, that's what has to be fixed. So uh, in the book, as you mentioned, uh, we talk about the California situation because we come from California, we're actively engaged there, but we make it very clear that this is not, what we're talking is not a model for the world, it's a way to think about exactly what I just said. What is democracy? What institutions matter? 
So uh, in the California case, uh, uh, well, what we do in the book, let me just say this about the last thing you said about, about the House of Lords and so on. I see Tony uh, Gittin sitting here. I don't want to offend, offend him by on the House of Lords. But, uh, but um, what we do in the book, and again, it's a way to think about democracy. We're not saying what we're proposing is, what every, you know, is the model for everybody. In the book, we talk about uh, participation without populism as a third turn of democracy. The first turn was the American founding fathers, as you pointed out, uh, who from their own experience in writing constitutions of the states after independence from Great Britain, uh, and coming to a constitution in 1789, and, and studying Greek and Roman antiquity, said democracy is a really bad idea. Uh, democracy does not appear, the word democracy does not appear in the Bill of Rights, in the Constitution, or the Declaration of Independence, or in any of the state things. That, that was the first uh, turn of American, uh, was called the Republic, which put a lot of filters between the public and power these mediating institutions. The second turn came 100 years later with the progressive era in the United States, which happened in the states, not from the, not from the top down, but in the states in response to corruption, technological change, much as we're seeing today, in which uh, the progressive movement said, let's have direct democracy. If the political class is so corrupt, they're not serving us, is what people are saying now, let's make the rules ourselves through direct, direct democracy. We adopted the Swiss, the, the Swiss system in most of our states, which allow people to make laws directly. Um, but they also uh, 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 included in their reform program for the first time getting cronies out of running government and bringing professionals in. City managers didn't exist before the progressive movement. They were run by cronies that belonged to machines. So they brought in both smart government and direct democracy. What we're trying to talk about in the book is a third turn where you combine both of those things, the deliberative uh, emphasis of the founding fathers and the direct democracy and smart government of progressive era for this new turn. And why now? Why now? Because of the impact, the participatory power of social media, which brings more players into the, into the fray. Now, the final point, uh, you made many points, and, but let me just make this one thing about the um, uh, uh, mediating institutions. On the contrary, uh, w w what we're proposing is not mediating institutions like, like the European Commission, which is so far from the public. Uh, but the opposite, and it comes from the California experience, and the California experience of direct democracy is, is in our view, something that's going to be very predominant in the future everywhere. In Italy, the Five Star Movement came to power, an internet party, uh, with their slogan, participate, don't delegate. The Yellow Jackets in France, uh, their biggest demand is direct democracy, let's vote and make laws directly. In California, we're, we are a direct democracy. We have a governor and legislature, but all the consequential decisions are made by the public at the ballot box. That means a majority has voted for uh, outlawing same-sex marriage, for getting rid of benefits for, uh, for immigrants. Both of those are thrown out in the courts. They've also voted to protect the coast. That's a great thing. They've also tied the fiscal situation in knots. We don't want to pay taxes, but we want the state to spend. So you've locked in uh, spending and locked out revenues, et cetera. So our experience and anticipating this is going to be happening across the West because of this rupture with uh, self-government and the public, you need mediating institutions to deal with the increasing de demand for direct democracy, which is part and parcel of the participatory power of social media and social networks. So uh, other, if you do not have mediating institutions to, feel, to deal with this impartial um, practices uh, and, and mediating trade-offs that I discussed in the beginning, direct democracy will look a lot like social media, the good and the bad and the ugly. Uh, so you've got to uh, look at where the democracies are headed, and you have to deal with it by forms of citizens engagement that are mediated. So you don't have a dumb mob, but you have collective intelligence. So I'll stop there because I'm getting lost in, in my, the following when, when your points. You, I, I just want to pick up on the point that you make about the, the, the structures in California. Because if, if you're saying you're not presenting that as a model for the rest of the world to, to follow, which I think you are saying that yeah. you, you don't want to do that, but there are things in there yeah. that are of interest to the rest of the world, is it possible to replicate when actually some of the things that are effective in terms of direct democracy in California are, are actually stymieing effective governance as well. No, they absolutely are. That's what, that's what I'm saying. Direct democracy is, um, <clears throat> last year... Um, but isn't the point effective governance? Yes, the, last year, last year um, 
about this time, I was in Rome at a conference um, with the Five Star Movement, uh -huh. um, the World Forum on Modern Direct Democracy. And uh, the room was full of people, or the conference was full of people, all who wanted, you know, disempowered citizens who wanted somehow to get a piece of power. They were all about direct democracy. Let us get in there and let us have a voice. Those who actually experienced direct democracy <laughs> were all about deliberation. We need institutions so that you just can't say, we don't like same-sex marriage, and that's the end of it. Because in California, if you gather 500,000 signatures and say, we don't like same-sex marriage, it goes to the ballot and the public votes on it, and it becomes um, uh, the law unless the courts challenge it. So to get back to your first point, so the, the What's the crisis of democracy, this, the same question was asked the other day in an interview with The Economist. They said, what's the problem? What, what crisis of democracy? You're just liberal cosmopolitans who don't like the, you know, the, way, the, people, yeah. the way you people are voting. <laughs> I said, no, it's not an issue of elections. You know, like I said, Macron goes this way, Le Pen goes that way. It's an issue of the institutions, of impartial institutional practices outside the ballot box that make democracy work and allow a governing consensus to happen in diverse societies. Do, do you disagree with the, the need for the presence of, of, of what Nathan's talking about? Well, I think what, what, what's sort of emerging here is that, um, I mean, I think we just have a, a different view of direct democracy. Um, so, I mean, my impression, correct me if I'm wrong, is that this book, or at least this section of the book, is born, I mean, I think you just said this, is born out of disillusionment with direct democracy. Um, and, 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 and you seem to be sort of saying that, you know, direct democracy is sort of here to stay. There's nothing we can do about that. Um, but we don't really like it. And, and so we have to try and sort of counterbalance it, is the term you use, with these deliberative institutions. I'm much more positive than that about direct democracy. Now, you know, it would Good be Good luck. Easy. Come to California. Well, but here's the thing. <laughs> but here's the thing. I've just lived through Brexit for three years. You know, and, and well, so there you go. actually this is also fertile ground. This is also very, very fertile ground yeah. to be, you know, lo lots of people, in, you know, particularly Remainers in this country, would have exactly the same view as you, which yeah. is direct, direct, direct democracy is a nightmare. The reason we have this constitutional crisis that we do right now is because we now have this clash between representative democracy, i.e. parliament, and the results of this referendum. So, you know, I have been through that too. Nevertheless, it seems to me um, not just that this is something we, where we can't turn the clock back, but I'm much more positive about it than, than you are, and I think we need to sort of figure out how to make this work. Um, just to say on that, I mean, that's our view too. I mean, it, it, I'm trying to say it's, it, it's, it's a historical inevitability um, fortified by the participatory power of social media, which, which drives people towards, direct, the political form of, of that empowerment is direct democracy. So it's something all democracies will have to deal with. Can I just add one more thing, though, because I think this is, this is important, that y you talked about um, these um, independent institutions mediating between citizens and government. Um, and um, it seems to me that the other institution which mediated between citizens and government in a completely different way was political parties. Um, so, you know, I'm very concerned about the decline of political parties. I've been very influenced by um, Peter Mayer, the Irish political scientist, who, who's written a lot about this. Um, you seem to be much more relaxed about the decline of, of parties. In fact, you seem to... This is, by the way, another thing which the Founding Fathers were quite opposed to, right, is parties and factions. Um, um, and you seem quite relaxed about this, the, the idea that you can sort of somehow replace the function that parties have with some kind of other institution. I don't think you can, for the reason I mentioned, which is I, I, I just don't think you can have these nonpartisan, independent institutions that reach these decisions in this independent way. I think we have to confront the fact that there are different interests in society. And the, you know, the reason I believe in democracy is because I think that the best way to resolve, the, to, to, to find the best policies is through a clash of interests rather than through um, some clever people figuring out what the best solution is. That feels to me like technical. No, I, I did have to respond to that. Sorry. So, uh, so um, it's not that the it's not that the institutions uh, that that collaborative competition, which is competitive elections, doesn't take place. The point is that the institutions, the platform in which that takes place, has to be depoliticized. The platform has to be impartial to allow that clash to take place. That's point number one. Point number two, just on the, um, um, on the parties, uh, 
uh, I know Nicholas, I think maybe this is what Nicholas wanted to say, but I mean, the parties, big, part, big tent parties outside of uh, Asian countries that have a culture behind it, like uh, civilizational weight, like Japan or China, outside those countries, the demassification of society is fragmenting the ability to bring everyone together under a huge tent. You know, you've got, you've got gays, again, gays for guns, you know, you've got uh, abortionists that want to protect animals. You've got a zillion constituencies uh, that don't fit under one tent. And if the tool of direct democracy is available and the tool of social network is available, it inevitably will create a fragmentation that you won't be able to um, bring together in political. That's my suspicion. We'll see. You know, it would be great if, they, if you could build a consensus around big parties like during the industrial era. But I'm afraid they're going the way of, of um, lifetime labor and mainstream media. I just think it's not going to happen. Yeah. Nicholas, I'd like you to sorry, just, before sorry. we open it up no, to the sorry. floor, go ahead. I mean, in a way, I would almost say, Hans, I, I wish you were right I, I think on, on everything. I actually think it's sort of, and I don't, I don't mean it in a negative way, but it's almost like an old-fashioned view of democracy. I think we are at a breaking point. And, um, the breaking point is multi-layered. One of them is I don't think political parties, traditional political parties, have, I mean, they're basically collapsed. I mean, if you look at even, let's say, this country, uh, there are lots of people within Labour who are in favor of Brexit or the other way around, and the opposite on the conservative side. So I don't think traditional political parties represent sort of, you know, you know, holistic views anymore. I think, as Nathan uh, said it, there are bits and pieces everywhere. That's the first thing. Second, traditional media used to be a filter. It's gone. Uh, so everybody has a voice. It's going to be irresistible for people to use that voice. Yeah. The question is, how do you filter those voices? And um, you've had, traditionally, you had filters, political parties, you had traditional media, I don't think they're coming back uh, the way they used to, but you still need a, an editing or filtering system. Um, so how do you do it? Government has to be a service organization to serve everyone. It can't be distant. It has, to it has to reflect the view of the people. How do you reflect the view of the people? Just through elections and referendums, that's very crude. You've seen it in Britain. So there has to be a more sophisticated way of doing it. And you can involve people thanks to technology. You can have citizens' yeah. assemblies yeah, that can be uh, an advisor yeah. to the public, to the elected officials, and to the bureaucracy, all of them. So you can use those tools to inform people, to inform government itself, uh, but you still need some form of filters. And just to sort of take it in a, in a concrete example, you mentioned Europe, and I do think you're right. Look, you have an imbalance, for example, in Europe. At the local level, things are way too politi politicized. Let's say France, the country I was born in. You have somebody who's elected, big majority, he's got a majority in parliament, he tries to do reform. As soon as he tries to do any reforms, psh, stop, okay? So you're in, a, you're in a very difficult environment to get anything done, any reforms done. So at the at home, you know, at, in any country, things, are very difficult in terms of bringing people together to build a common future. Then at the European level, the exact opposite, very bureaucratic, too distant, people don't feel that their voice is heard, and it's not heard, and there is no democracy of Europe. So on one side, too far away, not, not uh, populist enough, if you want, not democratic enough, and the other side, all about populism and about elections and about um, sort of the latest, um, uh, you, you know, you know, whatever a political uh, football, and neither is good. So you need a reconceptualization of where we are using modern tools, and they are modern tools. They have changed the game. We've got to accept them. We've got to in integrate them, and it's going to be. It's. You know, and we are at the beginning of having to rethink how to make the democracies work, not so that they're too far away from citizens. Yes. They have to engage citizens, but they have to filter. Uh, okay, uh, 
thought, just hold the thought that you're having because I'm going to open it up to the floor. Uh, please wait for a microphone. Uh, two hands have gone up straight away. So let's have the woman right at the back, followed by the man in front of her. Please tell us who you are. Hi, I'm Lynn Forrester de Rothschild. Um, so I think it is great and vital to, to address democracy. But in thinking about this for a few years, and more in the context of inclusive capitalism, I've come to believe that to talk about models of democracy is a little bit like rearranging the chairs on the deck of the Titanic um, for two reasons. One is that, is that we have seen in America and Britain that regular people aren't thinking uh, in this way. And how do ideas connect to them? Which leads me to my second and um, most important observation is that I think our problem is that we have accepted neoliberalism as an operating function for the social contract among all of us and our institutions. And basically, that needs to be replaced in, in the same way that it replaced what drove Keynes and government, you know, pre-war, post-war. So, so I think what we, re, we need to up our game in two ways. Intellectually, we need to think about how do we need to change our culture, our religion, our definition of happiness, our definition of success, so that it creates a world that responds to the people who feel so disenfranchised by these very, you know, uh, ivory tower conversations. And I think that's where we need to put our best thinking. Thank you very much. Anyone want to, it wasn't, it was an observation, a very insightful one, but um, anyone want to respond? Yeah, I mean, Lynn, I would say, uh, yeah, I mean, I, said, I think we agree. That's part of the whole point of the book is you have to rethink a number of these things. And you talked about inclusive. That's the whole point. Uh, people feel excluded or included, and everything is a fight where they're winners and losers. The question is, how do you bring people together? Uh, you were not here, I think, when we started about this idea of pre-distribution, bring people in from the beginning as opposed to after the fact on the economic side. Uh, so we talked about this idea of universal basic capital as opposed to uh, you know, other mechanisms. But the idea is, yes, you've got to you know, find ways to bring people together as opposed to not. And I think that's part of you know, what we try to expose in the book. In, in the book, I should say, we call it pre-distribution, which is uh, making sure everyone has universal basic capital it is inclusive capitalism. So, I mean, it's another word for what we're arguing, but it's particularly relevant in the digital age when employment and income are being separated from productivity growth and wealth creation to be able to, to distribute wealth to those who are, pre-distribute wealth to those who are losing their jobs from intelligent machines. So I think, I think all three of us agree that neoliberalism is, is what went wrong, as it were, or part of what went wrong. Um, and so I think we broadly agree on that story over the last 30, 40 years. Um, but it seems to me where we differ is precisely this point that we discussed earlier on, which is my understanding of that story of neoliberalism over the last 30, 40 years, or hyperglobalization, how, you know, whichever term you want to use to describe it. Um, it seems to me that part of the story of that is the growth in non-majoritarian <coughs> institutions, independent agencies, um, and the removal of ever more areas of um, policy um, particularly economic policy, out of the space of democratic contestation to be decided on by these independent bodies, um, often international bodies. And, you know, again, the EU is the sort of, I think, the, the, sort of ex the most extreme example of this. Um, so, um, whereas I didn't get the impression from the way you tell that story in the book that you see that as being part of the problem. Uh, we just do. I mean, we agree with Danny okay. Roderick, okay. you know, and, okay. and we say that... Then, then it does seem to okay. me to be a little surprising, then, to propose more independent agencies as the solution. That's the bit I don't get. Look, a, a, uh, a citizen's assembly in California to vet an initiative that outlaws same-sex marriage is hardly the same thing as yes. a global trade tribunal. Yes. 
I know, he, I know she wants to go on. I, so. I, I, I just want to get as many questions yeah. in as possible. The gentleman who's got the microphone. Um, my name's Alex Folks. I One of my uh, things I did in the past was I ran one of the Remain campaigns, the subsidiary Remain campaigns, in the Brexit referendum. Um, uh, thank you. <laughs> um, people will obviously disagree with my stance, but I think one of the best things about democracy is that you have competing ideas and they battle it out because by challenging each other you explore the weaknesses in each other's concepts and usually not always but usually the best ideas of best outcome will win um, i think if you create citizens juries or whatever you call them uh, firstly i think that existing politicians are loath to cede control to anybody else um, and you may create these citizens juries and they may come up with a fine solution to something uh, but ultimately it is the people in Parliament the people who or the governors or the whoever will take a decision and that might be wholly unrelated to what the citizens jury comes up with uh, and you ask for some intercession between government and citizen to me that's always been Parliament one of those organizations has been Parliament so the government will try to govern for everybody. They will fail, but they will try to govern for everybody. Parliament is there to represent the interests of the people. And one of the, the, the things that we have in this country is we have those direct, directly elected MPs, the same as the states, what you don't have in mo many countries around the world, but those directly elected MPs, you have that ability to talk to your own individual MP, to be able to have the, your, your voice heard. Ultimately, this will fail, I feel, uh, direct democracy because of what we saw in the UK referendum, because of Facebook, because of re interference by outsiders, because of people, bots indeed, because of people who will simply lie and change their mind after the vote has been taken. Now, that's a very prejudiced point of view from my, but I accept that. <laughs> But I feel that that, that, that is the, the flaw in the solution that you're proposing. Uh, okay, I, I just want to get another couple of questions in and then maybe you can respond. Uh, the gentleman over there in the back and then the gentleman here in the front. Uh, thank you, good evening. My name is Paul Turner. Um, I actually, I'm going to try to ask a very simple question, uh, which is that you propose um, mediating institutions. Surely that's just another way of saying that people who are not elected get to decide. Hans, do you want to respond? No, not Hans, sorry, Nathan, would you like to respond to, to that? Uh, I'm not sure what the last point meant. I'll say something here. Um, <clears throat> I think uh, the participatory power of social media, which levels the playing field of information between amateurs, professionals, uh, et cetera, et cetera, also undermines the idea of representative democracy, ultimately. Um, and the direct democracy is being demanded and a mediated direct democracy uh, that, that we're arguing for uh, is both a, co a, a compensation, a complement to representative government and a compensation for its declining legitimacy. Elections, you have big faith in elections. Um, The f reason the founding fathers, uh, well, the founding fathers made one big mistake to expand suffering. I mean, I'm not saying it's a mistake in any moral sense, but I mean, in a political governance sense, by expanding uh, suffrage, you would allow people to control government better. In fact, what happens is the vast uh, uh, electorate uh, uh, couldn't operate without uh, factions or parties organizing it. And those who have the interest and the time, the money and the connections, are the ones who dominate elections. So elections are, are, are not representative necessarily of the interest of all, certainly not the interest of all society. Uh, in fact, there's a book by a, a, a guy named Sitaraman, who is an advisor to Pete Buttigieg, who's one of the presidential candidates, called the Middle Class Constitution, who argues that elections actually create aristocracies because they leave the average citizen out uh, and uh, let, not let things, but things that are controlled by those who have the money and time. This is certainly our experience in California, certainly experience with direct democracy. The oil companies come in and say, we wanna kill your climate change legislation and we're gonna call ourselves the jobs initiative 
and they put $70 million into a, a campaign to undo, uh, you know, the um, election. So I just go back to my initial point. Elections are not the only thing about democracy. It's the impartial institutions and platforms that allow for this coll collaborative competition between competing parties and competing interests. If those impartial institutions are destroyed, or if consensus is decimated by polarization and partisanship, that's what's the crisis of democracy. But can you just but answer I, directly yeah. the, 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 the gentleman I, asking that question? Nicholas, uh, go ahead. I want to, want to say one more thing about the referendum point. The reality is that the ref referendums are a way to disintimidate you know, elected officials. But, and I think you're right about that. The reality is that it's going to become a fact, every, meaning you're not going to not be able to deal with it in pretty much every democracy because citizens are demanding it and it will be irresistible uh, from a governance standpoint. I'm not saying it's good, but we have to deal with it. Let me just get the microphone here for this gentleman here in the front. And I, I wonder if you will just, um, Nathan, just address that question. Which, what, the, the question again? The, the, the question the gentleman asked in the corner, which is that the, 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 the boss, what you're arguing for is for people who will be making the decisions are unelected when you're talking about these mediating in, institutions. No, let me, let me make... They, they inform the bodies, a little bit like juries, that will inform and advise. They don't necessarily make the, the uh, decisions. Let me, let me give you a, a specific example in the book. And uh, I hope you buy the book. Uh, hello. Hello. I hope you buy the book because I go through a specific example of this in the case of California. Uh, in California already, as I said, the direct democracy is established and the voters love it. They don't want the politicians to make the decisions, okay? So we're proposing mediating bodies that take the raw public sentiment, no same-sex marriage, get rid of immigrants, for example, or don't pay taxes, but keep services. Take that raw sentiment, formulate it into policy, have neutral, impartial institutions that can formulate things into policy, that take, care, take the whole body politic into account, and then put it back to the public, either to the elected representatives for a vote, or back to the public in a, in a confirmation referendum. The public in the end, or the public's elected representatives, always decide in the, in the, in the concept that we're using. You're not replacing uh, the public with, with uh, the legislators with unelected leaders. Okay. They're the mediated body. They're not the ones who make the ultimate decisions. They're the one who process the policy. So, gentlemen in the front, and then Kirsty behind. Now, my name is Oliver Grimson, and I just want to put three points or questions to you. Given that democracy is always a messy affair, uh, I think the point which was raised uh, early on, is there really a crisis, uh, is a very valid point. Because if we go back a few decades in the US, Britain, France, uh, and Italy, we had almost a breakdown in society because of the political uh, confrontation during the Nixon and the, the LGBA where there were riots, uh, there were fighting, there were complete uncertainty. In this country, there was a period of uh, strikes, even having to cut down uh, the working week. In France, there was a revolutionary stage where the president disappeared. In Italy, uh, politi political leaders were ki kidnapped and also assassinated. Compared to this state of affairs, we are in a relatively good shape. So uh, <clears throat> I, I really want you to argue more strongly that there is a fundamental crisis, even if you don't like the outcome of the democratic process. My second question is, for those of us who look at California from afar, we seem to have the impression it's a, it is a primary example of a dysfunctional governing system. <laughs> But you have the uphill task of trying to sell the rest of us that this is somehow a democratic governance model. So, so my question to you, how are you going to go about uh, counteracting this kind of global image of California? And my third point Let, is... Let's just stick with... Let's just no, no, stick no, with no, no, because I want to bring that in. My third point is the democratic <coughs> transformation in Asia minus China. Because if you take India, 
you take Indonesia, and you take Korea. It's a remarkable operational functioning state of affairs of a democratic transformation, and how India managed to have 900 million people voting and turning out the elites and replacing them with other political parties is, I think, a primary example of how democracy is functioning in a fascinating way. Okay. So my question is, why have you not brought these other Asian countries into this analysis of China versus California? What, what, okay, go, go no, ahead. I, 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 uh, the only thing I'll say about India, really quick, is 70 years after independence from this country, 50% of people still don't have toilets. So I'm not sure what voting means. So that's number one. But I don't want to argue about it. We decided not to talk about China and India. So I have a lot to say if you want to go there. But California. Um, you clearly haven't persuaded him, Nathan. <laughs> well, the, the, the great thing about the great thing. Wait, 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 wait. The great thing. The great thing about the about these discussions it allows you to to um, kind of uh, signal your themes of a book in the hopes that you will buy it and say, hey, uh, now I understand what they mean about California when I read the book. The premise of the whole discussion is how dysfunctional California's direct democracy is. That's the premise. How to fix it. And it happens to coincide with the global trend towards people wanting more direct democracy. And what makes it different than earlier crises of democracy, as I keep pointing out, is the advent of social media, the participatory power of social media, the leveling of the playing field between amateurs, professionals, politicians, and the people, et cetera. That's what's different about the crisis, and that's what we respond. California, in a sense, is a canary in a coal mine. We're trying to fix it. We, we've uh, tried to tame the direct democracy with some deliberative processes. Um, but California, is, if you really want to go through this functions, I, you know, we can stay here till midnight, but, and I can, I can tell you. But we're not going to, so I'm going to, take I'm going to take three more questions, Kirsty, and then there, and then well, it's here. not a model. Yeah. Excuse me. It's not, we're not saying it's a model. We're saying it's the Petri dish in which to uh, raise these issues, because I think the rest of the democracies are headed in the same direction. So yeah, I just got a quick question, which is, I wondered uh, to Nathan whether you had looked at the example of citizens' assemblies in Ireland in the lead up to the abortion campaign, um, where they played an incredibly, um, I think, positive uh, role in stopping populists getting hold of what is a very emotive and divisive issue, as we have indeed seen in the United States. Yeah, totally. We, we looked at it. And we looked at it. Uh, we know the guy, David Farrell, and the people who did that. Some people here in Great Britain, as you, as you may know, are proposing citizens' assemblies to now deal with the, uh, the, the Brexit, if there's another Brexit vote or confirmation referendum. Uh, it showed in a, in a very highly emotional and polarized issue like abortion, these things can work. Uh, gentlemen, at the back and then at the front, and then we're going to have to stop. Hello, my name is Christopher René. Uh, you were talking about the founding father. It made me think of the following. The question arose immediately, who was allowed to vote? And namely people who were able to read and write, who had an education. It seems to me that demo democracy might be working very well. Talking about America, you look, you have incredibly diverse president, one after the other. You can have Trump, you can have Obama, you can have cut and so on and so forth. It seems to me, and you were talking about the referendum uh, here and also in Europe, there seemed to me to be a huge disconnect between the information as, uh, or the knowledge provided to citizens. Democracy will only work, and you were talking about China and India, I think the same problem. It will only work if people have access to proper knowledge. And Nicola was talking earlier about pre-distribution and how you could share 30% and so on. How about putting this algorithm open source so the knowledge can be shared? You don't help people by giving them the result the, of whatever it is, but by giving them the means to do it for themselves. So it seems to me that democracy actually is quite healthy today. What we've all forgotten is to actually share knowledge. Instead, what do we do? We give just information, information retrieval. When people voted for Brexit, 
the, was there any communication from the government? I don't think so. In France, even worse. In Europe, nobody has any clue uh, about how the whole thing is run. So I think the problem is not purely political, it's a little bit deeper. It somehow reminds me of what led us a few thousand years ago to the Dark Ages. Anyway, I think food for so. Thank you very I'll much, gentlemen here person. in the front. Uh, thank you. Uh, Andrew Marshall, uh, Cognito. I haven't read the book. It seems to me, uh, uh, perhaps quite naturally from the US, there's a lot of focus on democracy within national silos. If you live in Denmark, and there's five million of you, you're acutely aware, or any European country really, you're acutely aware that decisions get taken beyond your borders in a way in a continental power you're, you're not. And that's why at least some people in Europe are quite keen on telling their ministers what they should vote uh, vote on when they go off to take decisions at a European level or a global level. There's been a world federation movement for many years, world government movement, and I just wondered whether any of the panel had, had comments on that. On world federalism or Denmark? On, on, uh, on, on the fact that the smaller states, yeah. Yeah, part of what's really important in democracy is its influence Go ahead, Nicholas. No, I didn't fully understand the question. Oh, okay. Do you want to ask the question in a different way, perhaps? <laughs> Democracy is about influencing states, and if you live in smaller states, that is why Europe came together, but it's not just Europe. People want to influence things in the UN, they want to influence things internationally, uh, which is, I think, a little bit different from living in a continental Agree, disagree? Agree, I guess, yeah. Yeah, I think it's always that issue of subsidiarity. At what level do you make the decisions, you know? Um, Denmark, I mean, the Social Democratic Party just uh, returned uh, uh, higher in the election because they took on the immigration issue, which the center left has not been willing to take on in, in Europe. It's an issue from outside Denmark, but they put their mark on it. Um, they couldn't do it at the European level. It, it seems, I mean, in both cases, though, I mean, I agree with you that things do look very different if you live in a small nation state than in the United States. That's clearly true. But on the other hand, you know, in both cases, the United States and Europe, you have a system of multi-level governance with diff decisions being taken at different levels. Um, and, you know, it has, it's a slightly different, you know, system in each case, um, although there are obviously some that would like to turn Europe into something like the United States in that sense. But actually, what I think is more interesting is that despite those differences, um, it seems to me the overall trend is in the same direction, which is my impression um, is that citizens are demanding decision making to be taken closer to them rather than further away. This is what I meant about this sort of the end of deference. Um, and, um, you know, I just, I, this, to, to make the link actually to China, it seems to me you have these two countervailing pressures going on because on the one hand and pro-Europeans will say this all the time you know you have to be a big unit in this world in order to have any kind of weight it was one of the key remain arguments um, so there's this kind of geopolitical pressure pushing towards larger units but it seems to me there's also a sort of bottom-up pressure around at least the west which is pushing towards smaller units because people want decision making to be closer to them and I think that's the basic problem that we have to that we have to deal with unusual example of Switzerland, which is a small country, which has all types of different trends all at once. So very local. I mean, number one, uh, every th there's federal, there's regional, and there's municipal. And they're, high, they're very divided. The tax, the, the tax revenues and spending is very much divided between these three. So there's very local. Uh, people vote all the time on lots of different things. There are referendums all the time. So it's, it's very close to them. At the same time, government truly in Switzerland is a service organization, very remote and not populist. So it's an incredible, very unusual mixture of two where people are very involved, uh, highly informed, have a lot of power over what's happening, especially at the local level, but government is actually 
quite remote from an emotional standpoint. There's a president that's a roving uh, uh, um, appointment, a, I mean a, a rotating appointment out of seven. Uh, and if you ask most people in Switzerland, who is your president, they don't know. So it tells you how remote they are from politics, at the same time very involved. It's a very unusual combination, and it seems to work. So the question is, in, in, I'm taking this, and it's a small country, it has lots of issues, you can't transfer these things easily. On the other hand, it tells you that it's a totally different way of running a de democracy, much less emotional, even though people are, can express themselves, and it's not everything it becomes a, a division of, an, of the entire country, uh, and they're able to keep sort of citizens together in one direction, keep, um, let's say, inequality relatively uh, subdued compared to other places. We have gone way over time, for which I apologize. And Nicholas is going to be late for his next appointment. Um, but um, thank you all very much for all of your questions and your attention. Uh, thank you to Nicholas Bergruen. Uh, Nathan and, and to Hans Kanani as well. Thank you all very much indeed. Thanks. <laughs>